today we have Mabel Ninen joining us. And Mabel and I first met in Nashville last spring of 2022. And she was telling me all about her new book. And now it's here. Yay. <laughs> and even more, we're just so glad um, to have you and to hear more about your book. And so before we dive into all of that, though, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Where you're from? Where you live now? What makes you smile? You know, what... Um, really motivates you, things like that. Thank you for having me, first of all, Candice, on your show. This is such an honor and blessing for me mm -hmm. to be serving your audience. Uh, and yeah, like we, we met in Nashville at, the, at Spark Media and I, we sat next to each other and I felt, uh, you know, this connection with you. So I'm so glad that we were able to partner like this. Um, yeah, about me, I was born and raised in India, and I grew up in a Christian home. And that is God's grace, uh, because less than 5% of Indians are Christians. Mm -hmm. And so God put me in a Christian home, and my parents taught me the Bible, and I had a regular happy childhood. Um, and after I got married, I moved to the US um, in 2008. So I've been in the U.S. ever since, and I've lived in so many different places. Uh, it's been 14 years, but we've lived in seven cities and at least 10 different homes. <laughs> yeah. um, but I've always, uh, when I was living in India, I mostly served in youth ministry. I'm still passionate whenever I get the chance to, um, you know, minister to young people. But in the past decade, I've been involved in women's ministry. I love studying the Bible. Um, I'm also a student now of uh, the Southern Baptist Seminary, uh, and I do it online. Um, I have a 10-year-old son and uh, uh, a, a Maltese pup who <laughs> behaves like <laughs> my daughter, <laughs> uh, though he's a he, but I treat him like a daughter. <laughs> and we live in Northern California. Well, goodness, but hearing how many times you moved, it made me want to think about all the times I've moved. And I think, I think it's probably seven times in three cities. But just with that, you know, I find myself wanting to get rid of more and more stuff. Like I want to take less mm -hmm. and less with me. And it yeah. was pretty funny, though, whenever I made the move from Texas to Oklahoma, I remember looking at this U-Haul that was completely packed full. And there were, I was just like, sheesh. Oh my goodness, I must really like to sit because I had couches <laughs> and chairs, like so many chairs, and there was just me at the time, and yeah. it's like, oh my gosh, but it's been just really cool to see how this move was all God's doing, and mm -hmm. he's brought some incredible women. I actually host a Bible study here, and all of the couches and chairs, they're all just filled. And so it's just cool to see his faithfulness through the move and yeah. even in that. But just practically speaking, um, you know, there are some of our listeners are anticipating a move probably coming mm -hmm. up. And so we're eager to hear you must be an expert packer if you've moved that many <laughs> times. So how do you determine what stays and what goes? Oh, oh my goodness. I mean, you're right. We have kind of become experts. I think my husband now just has a list of things to do when we mm. move, you know, whom to notify of the change and yeah. uh, all the administrative issues too. It's not just things. But um, I think I have never been the kind of person who um, who keeps, you know, the, the keepsakes, mm -hmm. even birthday cards, the, the second or third day, they're in the trash. So mm -hmm. I think that's a good thing yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, that allows me to get rid of things easily. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer, you know, uh, to keep those memories in my mind. I don't hold on to things like that. But at the same time, uh, moving so much has like you said, made me really think about what's important to keep mm -hmm. uh, and what's not. So um, I'm, I can give you an example. There's a swing in our patio mm -hmm. in one home that I actually purchased from uh, an old man. And he told me about its history. It has been in his family and we put it in our patio. Mm -hmm. And when we were moving just three years ago, my husband said, let's get rid of this. I mean, you hardly use it. You don't sit on it. 
but I don't know why that I'm attached to it. And I said, no, please, like this has to go with me. So I'm, I'm surprised that I was attached to it and I wanted it to go with me. It's not like I use it all the time. But maybe, you know, it was just some kind of a connection to my previous home. And I wanted something like how kids use their blankies, right, to help them with transitions. So I, I do have uh, those things that I, I think I tend to take with me everywhere. Yeah, I definitely I think, take all my books with me. Yeah. And I think your dog is making sure that you'll always take him with take, you. Yeah. <laughs> We're yeah. hearing you loud and clear. <laughs> but, you know, what's crazy to me is just seeing how we can, you know, we have to do that, practically speaking, with our packing. But God doesn't do that when he's painting the masterpiece for our mm -hmm. lives. He doesn't choose, like, specific experiences oh i'll use this and i'll use that but i'm not going to use this or this he uses yeah. all of it yeah and i think i see that so clearly in your story and um, because it's those experiences that we like those that are maybe ordinary or they feel insignificant at the time and even those that we'd rather skip altogether but he mm -hmm. uses all of them for his purpose in yeah. our lives and so i'm curious i know you talked just a little bit about growing up in india as a christian but if you want to expand on that a little bit more and help us know like how did that experience as a young child help you live out the gospel truth that jesus talked about to be in the world but not of the world sure i'm very you know um happy that i was raised a christian in a, in a minority in that sense because from a very young age, we learned to stand up for uh, stand up for God in a way that is not hostile, uh, or we don't come across as arrogant, but we really learn to, to blend in and engage with the culture, but still always bear in mind that we are different and that we serve a completely different kingdom. Um, because growing up, wherever we went, whether it was a school or a college or office, I was always one of a hundred people uh, there. Uh, and, and you know, even though um, all Indians, no matter which religion, we have some shared values. And so it's not like I completely disagree with them. There are a lot of shared values among the Indian Hindus, Christians or Muslims. But at the same time, I think um, as a Christian, there are certain things that uh, I, I just wouldn't agree with my friends or wouldn't go along with them. But um, I, I think I took great joy in standing up for God. And I'm not saying this out of arrogance, but I really did not uh, fear a backlash. And I'm not saying this in most cases, yeah. but for instance, um, you know, Hindus, whenever there's a happy occasion or whenever they go on a pilgrimage, they always offer some kind of food to idols and they bring that food back and they will offer the food to families and friends, uh, family members and friends, uh, because they want you also to get that blessing. It's a way of invoking blessings. Mm -hmm. And so right from our childhood, whenever a Hindu friend, you know, came home with good news and they would give you the food, you know, it's offered to idols, uh, but we would politely every time refuse. And um, I, I did that throughout, even working in an office space to say, no, I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend you, but this is something that I cannot partake. Mm -hmm. And we remain friends. I never, you know, it's not that that created a wedge between us. So, um, and, and at the same time, you know, because Indians are spiritual in nature. Mm. Everyone believes in some God. Mm. So they really respect uh, anyone who talks about God or who holds on to their religious values. And so if I tell someone I cannot come to your event because I have to go to church, mm. they are not going to look down on me. They, they understand that. Mm. And they actually value that in a person that someone believes in God and is um, religious or spiritual in a way. So I never felt pressured to hide my identity as a Christian, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, I think that's just really cool to see how you learn to stand firm and even in in such a kind way too. Um, that yeah. your beliefs didn't have to be divisive. Um, yeah, you could still be friends. You know, and I think sometimes society, not sometimes, all the time, it seems like our society is telling us that we have to agree to be friends. Yeah, and you know, I just don't think that's the case. Um, yep, we see, absolutely. Um, Jesus. Jesus didn't do that, you know. He he was friends with everyone across cultures, across beliefs. Um, yeah. He still treated them with kindness, um, yeah. and so you know. And even on our part to be sensitive mm -hmm. to what offends other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For instance, I know that uh, my Muslim friends don't eat pork, or Hindus don't eat beef. It's a very religious thing for them. Uh, and so I was always sensitive to that, not to serve them that or not to eat those foods in front of them. So it goes both ways. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my work, I'm in a very diverse community and I'm thankful for that because it just opens my eyes and helps me um, in that way, like be of the world, <laughs> be in the world, but not of the world. Yeah. And, you know, and still respect others' differences and um, not to say that I'm giving up my beliefs, but also just not imposing mine on others that I think yeah. that we all have that choice to come to Christ and it's their mm -hmm. personal choice, but that we can still be loving and be that voice of hope and be that light in their lives. Um, cause it's not our job to change their hearts. You know, God's going to do that. Yeah. So really cool to see that. Um, also I'm just in awe of your resilience. I think it's still just, you know, did you say moving 10 different places across two co continents and seven cities is that what you said <laughs> yeah you know for me the farthest i moved was like two hours to college and then four hours um when i moved from texas to oklahoma and even that was a monumental leap of faith for me and so you know i think even when it comes to faith i believe it's not necessarily the size of the step but the mm -hmm. courage to take the step and yeah. in your book, Far From Home, you talk about very openly about the challenges that you faced as an immigrant, separation from all things familiar, fracturing of identity, even the sense of homelessness mm -hmm. um, that you felt. And so I'd like for you to expand on that a little bit for us, and especially that sense of homelessness. Um, how did that draw you nearer to God's side? Yeah, um, great question. And you know, before I moved, for me, home was uh, was set. I, I did not think of redefining it in any way. Um, in a sense, you know, I, I was born and raised in Hyderabad, which is a city in, in India. I would used to call that home. Mm -hmm. And then I had my parents' home and then my home after we got married, all in the same small area. Mm -hmm. So I never really thought of, uh, you know, this concept of home until I moved. And actually, when we moved to the U.S., um, for the first few years, at least, we always stayed in furnished apartments. Mm -hmm. So and, and so the nothing belonged to us, really. <laughs> Everything was just given and we just had to buy groceries or our own clothes, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I used to sometimes look around and think nothing is is mine. And. Um, it's the same company that used to furnish these apartments. And so it used to feel like a hotel room sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, maybe to feel like home, I would put up pictures uh, of my family. Um, but that was the only thing I could call my own. Yeah. And so that changed my definition of home being more about the relationships that we feel safe in. Because I knew that um, my husband was with me. Uh, and that was home to me, just being with people. Yeah. But then, you know, taking that one step further, we cannot find permanence and stability always in relationships too, mm -hmm. as we very well know. So yeah. thinking of home as, as where I, you know, home is where my family is or where my people are at is also, according to me, not a, a, a sufficient um, definition, it doesn't do justice to home. Because